Good morning, again, good morning. Nice to have you all. It's not going to help if my Bible is upside down. <laughs> yeah. I don't like my life. Anyway, so let's just uh, start in prayer here. Father, we thank you. Um, thank you for these weeks that we have been together, these months that we have been together, and how you have been leading us and teaching us, and this amazing um, man of God, that uh, you placed and his words in the Bible, Lord, they have, they have been a, a wonderful eye-opener and an eye-opener into our lives also and that what you want for us. So, Father, I pray that you would bless this time and, and I ask that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Julie had it a little bit rougher than I did. Julie had, how many did you say, Julie, you had? 14, 14 different chapters. Um, that she was trying to work her way through. I had nine. Um, and so I decided that I, when I went through all these and I was looking at them, I didn't kind of put them in the order that they were in the book, but I, I saw a, 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 an order to them. And, and what was coming to me was that I love the way that the Psalms reflect all the different moods and responses that David had throughout his life to different situations that he encountered. And we have so much information about his life, but we have also so much information of, you know, through the Psalms of what he was going through you know, internally. And they're just, they're amazing from that standpoint. And so I kind of, thinking about that, I thought, you know, here we are trying to become more like um, a, a woman after God's own heart. And, and so taking, and through the year, I hope that that is what has happened for you. I hope that, that certain scriptures and certain segments have, have spoken to you about where you can go and how you can make your life more, more as like a woman after God's own heart. And so we're going to start with the first one. Um, and I'm going to just kind of try to do a little vignette of every one of them. And so... Probably in those chapters, you will have found scriptures and verses that stick out to you, that speak to you. These are the ones that spoke to me. And so in Psalm 138, it was verse 6, and it says, the, the, the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. So David, in this, in this one, he sees himself kind of small and lowly uh, while his, his enemies in their pride, had seen themselves as very large and important. Mm -hmm. And he's telling us that our God is this great creator who loves little people. He loves us. We don't have to be great and, and famous and rich and, and, and influential in order for God to love us absolutely the same way he loves each person in this world. And that is what is so beautiful about him. You know, a, a few weeks ago we talked about... Um, I'm not going to say his name right, Mephibosheth. I did it! <laughs> and he was, he was Saul's son that was crippled. And how David invited him to the king's table for the rest of his life. And, and the concept of being at the table with, the, with this crippling, you know, he was crippled. And, and, but nobody saw that sitting at the table. when he, You know, of course, now it's a modern table, so we sit at it. Then they lounge next to the tables. But we're going to use a modern-day table because the idea is that he pulled up to this table, and he was just like everybody else, even though he was crippled, even though he was, he was maimed, and no one had a right to question who God brings to his table and what their crippling situation is even if they're still at the table crippled, which he was. And, and I love that. God loves everybody. Even to this day, um, the greatest minds cannot penetrate God's mysteries. And, and, and he talks about this a little bit um, later. But I love Stephen Hawking. I don't know if you've heard of him. He was this um, big guy. He was not a believer, but he was. He occupied what they called the the Lucasian chair at the Chamber University, Cambridge University, and he was one of the most brilliant people that ever lived. And, and he had a best-selling book, and it was called A Brief History of Time. And he wrote in this. He said, however, if we discover a complete theory, <coughs> it should in time be understandable by everyone, but not just a few. Then we shall all philosophers, scientists, and just ordinary people be able to take part in the discussion of the question of why it is that we and the universe exist. 
He never found that answer. It's sad. Uh, we know the answer to that. It's, it's that God and, and that we are able on certain levels to understand the mind of God. How beautiful is that? He never believed, and, but he was humble enough to admit that humans simply don't know. And so David says the creator exists and that his mind is large enough to fill the needs of every single person in this universe from the beginning of time until the end of time, which there is no end of time. And that when, when he takes up residence in our hearts um, and we surrender to him, our lives change. And God hears the prayers of the humble at heart, but the self-efficient, self-sufficient and the self-important prayers of those um, God only knows them from a distance. So humility is so critical here when we come to the Lord, recognizing that we're just, just girls. We're just girls. And, and, but I love that. I love that in the midst of that, he goes, yeah, but I really love you. Amen. I just think you're so fun. I love every aspect of your personality and your character. You are very unique and special. And I love the fact that every single one of you is his favorite. You are his favorite. Now, I've said it over and over again, but I'll keep right on saying it. You're his favorite because you hold a place in his heart that no one ever has in all of history and no one ever will besides you because you have something special about you that God adores. And from that standpoint, you're his favorite. Psalm 139 says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I love this chapter. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. I love it. Sometimes we don't let people get to know us completely and because we're afraid that, you know, maybe they'll discover something about us that they don't like or that they'll discover something that we don't want them to discover. I remember years ago I was at a prayer meeting and it was one of those meetings where where the Holy Spirit was moving and the guy that was the the man that was in charge of it was was right on key with the Lord and he was kind of walking up and down the aisles. Well, I had a, a something and 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 as he's walking, he stops at my row and he kind of glances over and I'm like <laughs> No, no. And he says, give me your hand. And I'm like, oh. God saw me. God saw me. But there are things, and, and, and I was healed of something that night um, from my past. And, and he saw it, and God loved me enough to point it out to him. And he didn't pray anything that was embarrassing. He just prayed for me. And the fact that God did that really touched my heart. He knows us. He knows everything about us. He knows all the bad stuff. You can't hide it from him. You've never been able to hide it from him, no matter how hard you try. And he loves you anyway. He loves you anyway. He loves everything about you. Not only does he know us, but he can never and will never be far from him. And, that, and this chapter goes on to talk about it. All the different places we can go when he's there. He's been there from the beginning. He will be with you till the very end. You will never be alone. Now, we all experience that feeling of being alone sometimes, being lonely in the midst of something we're going through and we kind of can't tell anybody else, nobody else really understands. And any of you been there? Yeah. Okay, so I'm not alone in that. <laughs> and, and God is there with us, and we are never alone in it. Verse 14 says that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. We are both fearful and marvelous. We have been given these qualities, and one of them is called free volition, free will, and that allows us to ignore God in certain circumstances and, and do what we want to do and, and, and live our lives. And, um, and, and that is part of that free will. We also are marvelously, incredibly designed. I mean, we have, do you know that our eyes can distinguish eight million colors? I didn't know that, eight million colors. What an amazing thing, just for eyes. We can hear about 350,000 different tones. That's just two things about these bodies that are so miraculous and so sensitive. We are so sensitive to touch that we can feel the weight of a single hair on our eyelid. That's amazing. I, that's always amazed me about horses, is that they are so sensitive to touch. If you've ever been around them, you can see that when a fly gets on them someplace, they, their skin, they can shake that part of their skin and shake the fly off. But at a dead run, going through poles that are distance 18 feet apart, 
um, at a dead run with a big old fat saddle with a, with a wooden tree and then pads underneath of it, that horse can feel when my eyes drop at a dead run. I don't know how they do it, but when we move our eyes like that, there's weight and they are that sensitive. And so you always have to keep your eyes up towards the goal because if you look down at the thing you're trying to get the horse to go around, he'll run right into it. He will move that, you know, so you, you kind of don't look. You have to keep your eyes up towards the prize, which is up here. Don't look at the obstacle. Keep your eyes up. But I'm amazed that they can feel that. The author of this psalm knew nothing about a lot of these miracles, but he did understand that the human body was amazing and the design and um, science now has, has really emphasized his feelings about it, that it, they are marvelous. And, and he, said, he said, I will praise you in the midst of that because of his creator. He understood that. It is amazing that even today, as advanced as we have become in science and technology, and especially the way the, the, the world works, especially the way the human body works, that there are still those people that, that think that it was just a surprise explosion like the, you know, the dictionary, you know, all the little letters coming up and coming down with, as a dictionary. It just isn't going to happen. They still are so egotistical that they believe that. They'll always be around that their egos and their, their own pride will not allow them to see that it was God himself. In 398, Augustine observed this in his book called Confessions. He said, people travel to wonder at the height of the mountains, at the huge waves of the sea, at the long course of the rivers, and the vast compass of the ocean, at the circular motion of the stars, and they pass by themselves without wondering. All these wonders are fingerprints of our God, and when we see them, it should lead us to seek him. God desires us to come to know him personally. In the mid-1600s, this pastor, uh, um, his name was John Don, and he wrote, you just can't get away from God. Isn't that wonderful that we can't get away from him? If you run from him, he runs after you. If you run to him, he embraces you. But wherever you are and wherever you go, his eyes of love will follow you. The psalm um, is, uh, the next one is, um, in 68, is a song of praise that declares God's victory as Israel, and so here David is like, we got this, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. He is full of faith at this point. He was full of wonder, he's full of faith, and he goes, let those who hate him flee before him. Are you like that way? Sometimes we're full of, of wonder at this magnificent God, and then we're full of boldness and strength, and we, we, can, we can conquer any enemy. In Numbers 10.35, we see that these words that he spoke were, were used by, by Moses in public prayer before they moved the Ark of the Covenant. And David probably used these words in this psalm because he understood that God is the creator and that he is the one that will arise and that he is the one that is the conqueror. And um, God is always the same, but he's always changing. And I love that about him because he caters and he, he changes the circumstances and the way he moves in each of our lives individually without changing the bottom line, which is he is a holy God and he is a God of love. And that's what he bases everything on, is that he is a God of love. So he will change things and change circumstances and change the way he, he responds and reacts and speaks to each individual according to where they're at. And I love that about him. We, we see that Jesus did the same thing too. He, he didn't just do everything exactly the same. Um, God isn't controlled by habits. And he doesn't manifest his power in the same way every time. Jesus would heal. When he healed the blind people, for instance, we get a sense of that. To one, he simply spoke and the person was healed. And another, he gently touched and that person was healed. Next time he rubbed spit mixed with clay into their eyes, and they were healed. And yet another one, he just used spit alone, and they were healed. It was very different, and the result, though, was always complete healing. That will always be the same. No matter how he works with you, no matter what circumstances he uses in your life to, uh, to, to work you, to change you, to, to draw him, you closer to him, the results are always the same, and they're always based in a holy God that loves us unconditionally. We can develop dead patterns in our own walk with God and start putting limitations on him because we want him to operate within, you know, specific boundaries. Do, do, the, do it this way. And he, he doesn't check in with me before he does stuff. 
you know, I look at stuff and I go, this is a perfect opportunity for you to do this, God. And he's like, yeah, no. <laughs> and, and he, sometimes we find ourselves going in circles and, and in a rut spiritually. And that's when we need to say, let God arise in my life. Let him be the leader of my life. It becomes this prayer to move and change the circumstances we're stuck in his way, not our way. Not our way. Psalm 69, um, verse uh, 1 and 3 says, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry. And my fingers are stuck. <laughs> come on, come on. Oh, for Pete's sakes. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. So here he goes from, from wonder to boldness to, ah! <laughs> God help me. I, I'm, I'm dying here. So this is called so often, excuse me, the poor man's prayer because it, he is so humble in this prayer and he's so vulnerable and he's so transparent before God. I love that. Um, he couldn't shrug off at that point the, the, the problem that people that he cared about and loved were slandering and betraying him. There's no other portion in the Old Testament that is quoted except Psalm 22, quoted more than these verses. Um, David was writing here more kind of like a prophet um, in, in more in any other place almost. In a thousand years before the incarnation of Christ, he's talking about these words predict many of the events that went on in the, in, in the Lord's life and death and des resurrection. So he cries to the Lord so much that his throat and his tears are gone and his burdens were so heavy at that point. You ever feel like that, that they're overwhelming you? You know, betrayal is a very painful thing, and it happens in so many people's lives, um, where um, someone close um, does something to them, and that's, that's the tough one, and betrays us, whether they're friends or whether they're relatives. It is so painful, and Jesus and David experienced this death of betrayal, and it did make them suffer for a while. It seems that it either makes us softer or harder, depending on how we deal with it. Yeah. And the bottom line here is forgiveness. Amen. In 1998, the Navy had uh, nowhere to go to store like 12,000 gallons of napalm. Remember napalm in, in Vietnam? Bad stuff. Bad stuff. They couldn't find anybody to take it for some reason. Um, they finally found somebody and that was going to treat it or process it. And it was a company in Indiana. But their, turn, their uh, whole protest, when they found out that they were going to bring in this napalm, this huge protest broke out. And they, were, they did not want this stuff, bottled napalm, in their cities. Gee, I wonder why. And so the company backed out. They didn't want to be anywhere near it. Bottled up anger, unresolved bitterness, is the root of bitterness, and it will destroy you. Jesus said, forgive us our sins, and we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us in temptation, but deliver us from the evil. It's called the root of bitterness. Years ago, we were at, I, I, we did this, this three months where we traveled all over the United States with a group, a core group of Christians, uh, singers. Um, several you would know, a lot of them you wouldn't know. Barry McGuire, second chapter of Acts. Pat Boone was there. Um, Dean, uh, Dean... What was his last name? Anyway, the, you know, so we had this, and what we would do is we would go into cities, this core group of like 50 singers, and then in the cities they would arrange for all these other churches to all get together and form this huge choir that backed us. And, um, and it was during that time, it was, it was a, um, uh, a thing called If My People. If My People Who Are Called By My Name Will Humble Themselves and Pray. And, um, and then it went on. And one of the things that we did in there was talking about the root of bitterness and how it can eat you alive and how you need to pull that out. There was a woman, and, and Jimmy, Jimmy Owens was the one that was leading this thing. He and his wife had written it. And he said, is there anyone here that is struggling with this? You know, bitterness that just, they've been hurt over and over maybe by that same person. You know what it is. And this woman, along with several others, knelt down and she began to pray. And she went on and on and on about the people that had hurt her. The list, I mean, we literally, the musician stopped. And we knew that God was doing something. The whole place shut down while this woman confessed to God all of the pain and all of the anger and all of the unforgiveness that was in her. 
David is appealing in Psalms 109 again, in return for my love, they are my accusers, but I give myself to prayer. Mm, good point. He is recounting this. Oh, I wanted to tell you this other thing. Ed had gotten a while back um, this, it was a thorns, this bushy bush that has these, produces these nasty long thorns that grow in Israel. And a lot of people believe that that's what the crown of thorns was fashioned out of. Um, maybe, maybe not. It would have been probably a good one to fashion the crown of thorns out of. Anyway, he brought this back and he wanted to frame it. And so we went up to an area in, in Banning and Beaumont where they have a lot of antique shops. And we found this really cool frame. And it had satin on, it was kind of ripped, and it was just perfect to put this crown in. He has it. And when we got home, he looked at the back of it. And on the back was written, people that have hurt me. And there was this long list of people. And we were just like, oh my gosh. And so whoever had written that years ago kept an account of the people that had hurt her or him and, and didn't want to forget. Oh my gosh, that's so dangerous. That is so dangerous. We have to forgive. And forgiveness is an interesting thing. It's not often that we just say it once. Sometimes you can do that and you're released. Other times it is something that you have to deliberately focus on. I, I know a friend and she's told me that I am free to share this situation where she was horribly abused as a young woman growing up. And she had some real issues with a few relatives. And for good reason, good reason. And she called me one day and she said, I, I have to go to this wedding and I don't know what to do because this person is going to be there. And I said, I, I, oh, wow, okay, we got to get started. And I said, you need to forgive them. How do I do that in three days? I can't, you know. So I told her, I said, put up post-its everywhere. Put them in your car, put them on your refrigerator, put them on your window, put them in your, in your Bibles, put, put them, hang them on your keys and say, I forgive him in the name of Jesus. And I said, you're not going to feel it. You just keep doing it and you choose to forgive them in the name of Jesus. She had three days. She goes to this uh, wedding. Guess who meets her at the door when she walks up to her parents' house? It was him. She calls me and she said, Rena, she tells me this. And she said, guess what? I said, what? He did it. He did it. In her heart, he freed her. She chose to forgive. Not once, but twice. Not twice, 50 times, over and over and over. She chose to forgive him until God did the work in her heart, and he did it. So David is appealing here, and he states that he's done everything possible to be loving and show friendship, and this is in Psalms 109. Then he calls for justice on his enemies. Get them, Lord. <laughs> the New Testament has a little bit different take on that. Um, there it says we are to have a different attitude towards our enemies, that one is higher and a little more selfless than this concept of justice. You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those that curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That's Matthew 5, 43 and 44. There is the key, ladies. I don't care what they've done to you. They couldn't have done much worse to what they did to this woman. He couldn't have done much worse. Let your imagination go and then add to that. It was really bad. And God freed her. Most believers are going to experience these kind of issues at least once or twice in their life. Maybe it is the way you were raised. Maybe it was a horrible situation that you finally extricated yourself from simply by the fact that you were old enough to get away. I don't know. I don't know. But there's stories in this room. There's stories out there of women that have been badly, excuse me, wounded. And they have good reason to be angry, but they have no reason to not forgive. Because that's for us. That's for us. That person may never know, but you do it in your heart. And you trust God to do the work and to free you from that bondage. And you will truly be free. God's given us two things that will help us um, grow in these areas also. And, and um, one of them is, and I, I'll tell you the story, this is guy, um, 
uh, F.B. Meyer, I don't know if you've heard of him, he's a British pastor, and he said, we make a mistake in trying always to clear ourselves. We should be wiser to go straight on, humbly doing the next thing, and leaving God to vindicate us. Because so often we want vindication, don't we? We want them to say, I'm sorry, that may never happen. We want to be vindicated and say that this wasn't us, we didn't do this, it's this person totally. Um, there are some hours in our lives where we are going to be misunderstood and we're going to be slandered and falsely accused. And at times it's very difficult not to act on the policy of the men around you in the world. The, the thing, very thing that David said, go get him, get him, Lord. It may never happen. It may never happen this side of heaven. They at once appeal to law and force and public opinion, but the believer takes his cause into a higher court and lays it before his God. We need to release ourselves, secondly, by forgiving that person. So we have to, number one, we have to repent. If we've been holding it and not forgiving them, we have a responsibility before God to say, God, I repent of that. Unforgiveness is wrong. Unforgiveness is a sin. You repent, and then you let God do the work in your heart to forgive that person. In Matthew, it says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's Matthew 6, 14 and 15. The act of forgiveness is not just for the person who wronged us, but for us. For us. And it's hard. I remember years ago, it was a silly situation, and it was where... Um, uh, Ed and I had gotten, you know, had a disagreement about something, nothing big. I, I don't even remember what it was. And, uh, and he said something that hurt my feelings. Because I was really, really sensitive as a young girl. And, um, and it hurt my feelings. And, and he came back and he apologized. And it was a true apology. And, and I remember walking out into the yard. I remember where I was standing in the yard, and I was like, God, that's not fair. I have to forgive him immediately. And he can just walk away going, I'm sorry. And then I knew he meant it. But I'm still hurt, and I'm still mad. And I'm still trapped. And, and I thought, that's not fair, God. Because not only did I hurt, get hurt, but now i got to work on forgiving him and getting released from the anger that I feel. You're right. That's exactly what you have to do. So when you're hurt... You could forgive, but you still have to deal with what's going on inside of you. But God will free you in that, and it is the act of choosing to forgive them. So I learned something then, and I learned that every time I got mad about remembering what he had done, I went, no, I choose to forgive him. Lord, help me to feel that. God freely forgives us. And the only, I heard this too, the only one suffering is the owner of the unforgiveness. Mm -hmm. yeah. That other person goes on. He went on because he had done the right thing. I've done that to people. I'm sorry. And they're sitting there bleeding, wounded on the ground, and, and they have to deal with that. We lock ourselves in a prison of negative bitterness and hinder our own relationship with God. Again, I, you know, I, it, this, this is a critical something for somebody that's listening to me. And it may not even be something you realize that you were holding. Ask God. Because each of those things that you might be holding are things that are holding you back from, number one, God's forgiveness and God's grace and his healing powers. Psalm 70 says, Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. So David now is in panic. All right, you got to do this, God, but you got to do it on my timetable. He opens the psalm with this plea, don't take too long, and he ends it up with another one, don't delay. And sometimes when we're in distress, it is often because we feel this, this pressure of time. Um, and, you know, I, I think sometimes that God just kind of chuckles when he listens to me because I'm like, okay, God, fix this, fix it now. And he's like, mm, no, we got to, there's a, there's a process here. And he's got the whole thing under control, and he never needs to hurry. He doesn't need to hurry because he has a pre-planned timetable and the power to bring everything into his plan exactly when it needs to happen. And that I love because I've watched him do that in my life. There are some advantages to being almost 72. <laughs> <laughs> and Ed and I have talked about this. What we have gone through in our lives, and we like to sit in the mornings and just talk about all the places that God has taken us, all the things that we have, have, the miracles that we ourselves have experienced in the dead of night going across communist borders with Bibles and tape recorders and, 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 and being searched 
by communists with big guns in the dark and, and watched God do miracle after miracle. It literally was that. Going into Czechoslovakia, we had letters from Christians that they were trying to get out to, the, to their freed relatives. We had tape recorders. We had half um, uh, translated books. We had Bibles. We had all this stuff. And on top of it, in the back of the van at 10 o'clock at night, when they were dragging people in, especially the, the women, which was unusual, and searching them, and I'm like, oh boy, I'm in for it this time. The guy leans into the car. He takes us to the back in the dark away from the front where all the other people were and we're like oh, this is not good and you know it's five americans no wonder they were suspicious and 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 the guy leans in the car and here i am sitting and he's got a machine gun on his shoulder and it slipped off and it kind of fell to the back and it was like right here literally it was this far from my face and i'm like okay god all right uh now would be a good time lord <laughs> and so they got us back there. I didn't even mean to tell this story. Anyway, they got us back there, and Jennifer, um, my, my darling baby at three years old, was sleeping in her little sleeping bag on top of all the stuff. And um, they come around to the back, and there was a woman that was leading this, this inspection that, any of you see the um, God Smuggler, the, the movie, with Corey Ten Boom? Okay, the, if you haven't seen it, the woman guard was a big gal with cropped hair that was the scariest looking woman you've ever seen in your life. And she evidently, well, that was a bit part she played, but she was there that night. And she comes around as gruff as possible. She opens the thing up and she puts her hand in and, and feels around and she touched Jennifer and Jennifer moved. And it scared her just like a girl as she went, ah! <laughs> and then she pulled her hand out so fast because she didn't know she was back there. And it scared her, and she got so flustered, she got mad, and she slammed the back of the tank down and said, get out of here. <laughs> God has a pre-planned timetable, and he's going to bring everything into his plan at the exact same time. I learned something about my God that night. Amen. And as scared as I was, I know who he is. And I know that nothing, not a hair on my head will be disturbed unless he allows it. Not a hair. He's got it down. We, he never gets caught off guard. And he never panics like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that was going to happen. Oh wow, what am I going to do? Um, no. He can travel back into time, up forward into, into the, the, the future. And that's difficult for us to recognize because we're caught in time. God's not. He can do whatever he needs to do to bring about whatever he wants. And he loves us. He loves you. There are three gates that lead into the Cathedral of Milan that illustrate this. One gate has an inscription in marble and it states, the things that please us are temporary. When you get to the second gate, there is a cross with an inscription. The things that disturb us are temporary. And then the third gate, the central gate, has a big inscription that reads, eternal things are the important ones. Yeah. What constitutes a crisis in your life on this earth? And we see a lot of crisis hanging around right now, don't we? It can be scary when you begin to watch the news and there's conspiracy theories and there's all these things happening and we got to do something, you know. Hurry up, God, do something. It's not a crisis in the eternal perspective. God's got to figure it out. We are tempted to think that, that he's not helping us in time, that he hasn't taken account all the variables, all the things that are happening, that he doesn't understand how desperate this situation is. But he is always on time, every time. Every time. Psalm 140, verse 7 says, Oh God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation, you have covered my head in the day of battle. So the head is one of the most vulnerable parts of our body. So David is, is, again, moving back into, okay, God's got this. And it, it is the most vulnerable part. I mean, probably every one of us knows that somebody that has had a serious head injury and, and that it changes them and, and sometimes kills them. You know, bicycle helmets are not mandatory for children because of these horrible, devastating head injuries. And um, injuries to the skull were even more prevalent during the time of David and Jesus. And so the head during a battle could be fatal if you got hit. 
um, much more than today. And of course, we don't do that much hand-to-hand -hand combat. So, but when David says that God covered his head, he meant that he protected his life. The New Testament in Ephesians, the helmet of salvation is meant uh, mentioned by the Apostle Paul as part of the critical armor, the whole armor of God. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Ephesians 6. No Roman soldier would consider going into battle without his helmet. With his helmet, he could fight with a certain amount of, of confidence. We are the same way. We have to remember to put on that spiritual helmet. My youngest daughter is, is a gentle, soft-spoken young lady, very strong, but very sweet. She's got a very gentle heart. And when she was just a little pipsqueak, um, I put her to bed, we prayed together, and, and, and then a little while later, it was Jen's turn to go to bed, and when she went in the room, uh, they shared a room, she came back out, and she says, Mom, Wendy's just crying. And I'm like, she's been in bed for 30 minutes, what's going on? And so I went back in there, and I'm like, baby, what's wrong? Are you hurt? Are you sick? Are you? And she goes, I just can't make up my mind. And I said, about what, baby? And she goes, I don't know whether I need to take ballet or tap. <laughs> <laughs> Neither of those were on the table. <laughs> we hadn't even talked about that. And that was something that would go on with her. Do you do that at night? You start... You know, mm, this is so fun because it's happened to me this morning. When I get up at five and I go back through this, I came to this part and I remembered this. And so what I began to do with my daughter as I prayed with her, I would put my hands on her head and I would place the helmet of salvation on her at night in the name of Jesus to protect her mind from the fiery darts of the enemy. And, and it worked. And right then this morning, God said to me, how come you're not doing that? I had to stop, and I must have sat there going, oh my gosh, I have been struggling with this in my life. I have a hard time, especially since the cancer, and that has to do with chemo, and a lot of women that have gone through it say this, their, their sleep patterns are just a mess, so are mine. And as soon as I wake up at night, I get a litany of things that need to be done, that need to be taken care of, that need to, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, and it was like God just said to me, how come you're not doing that? And I'm like, I know that truth. I know that truth in my life. I've seen it work. You can bet tonight I'm putting on the helmet of salvation. Put it on tonight. Put it on and trust that you're, you can't go into battle no matter, no matter where it is without that helmet. It gives us an assurance of salvation and confidence in God in the middle of the devil's attacks on our minds. He tries to hammer us, especially at night for me, with discouragement and doubt and pointing out all my failures and my faults. But God, our Savior, says, no, not only do I love you in the midst of this, but I'm going to give you the tools that you need in order to protect yourself from the enemy. Job had, was devastated in his life, and he said in Job 13, 15, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job and David wore the same helmet, the same one that's available to you and I to know with confidence that God is our protector and that he will heal our minds. He will protect our minds from the enemy. Psalm 24 says, Blessed be the Lord who has not given us prey to, uh, as prey to their teeth. Our soul has escaped a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. So in those days, uh, fowlers were, they were professional bird catchers, and they captured birds by spreading a net on the ground, and they would attach a spring trap or a snare to this net, and then they would sprinkle grain or something else tasty, um, and, and it would bring the birds, and, and they would be trapped. So um, the, pr the trigger would snap when they were on it, and, um, and they, they made their income from doing this. They captured the birds. Some of them they sold as pets and whatever for, for food, and others like doves and pigeons were used for the sacrifices. So David uses this picture to remind us that it's God who keeps the fowler from us and us from evil over and over and over. So I have to tell you this story. We have, um, we live out kind of, you know, we've got about an, almost two acres of, of land, and, um, and every year in the spring, we get inundated with ground squirrels. Now, that's not necessarily a big deal, except they go out into the house and undermine it, but they also get out to my horses, and they get into the grain, and they get, you know, they make a mess, and they carry bubonic plague, 
It's a known fact. Now, probably the ones at my house don't, but I'm not taking the chance. I really don't like them, but they're so cute. They're so cute with their big eyes in there. And so I got myself a live trap. And, and it's, it's, um, it's, it's, you know, all they do is go in there and they can't get out. And so, uh, and then I, I rehome them. <laughs> Bye bye, and we take them other places and release them where there's water and food. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm enough of an animal person that I'm very careful with my crowd squirrels. And um, so the other day, I, I caught one, and I'm like, great. So I, I, I had food in there for him, which is what drew him into the trap. Something tasty, like us, you know, we get drawn into traps because there's something tasty. And I walk up. And this little squirrel looks at me like, hey, I'm busy here. And he's got his cheeks absolutely filled with, with, um, with it was dog food. And he's just like, this is great. And he's not even afraid of me. And I'm like, well, you little booger. And I picked up another piece and I held it and he stuck his nose out to see what I had in my hand. Of course, I was on the outside of the cage. You know, I'm not stupid. Um, they will bite. And, um, but he was totally relaxed. And I thought, well, you, you know, so, so. I go in the house because it was I was going to wait and then go in, in a little while to go release him. And uh, when I came back out, he was gone. I thought, how'd you get out? Well, I'd left the trap open on the top. It has a big, you know, opening, and I had not sealed it. And so he just got out. So I thought, well, there's that's the end of that one. Well, the little dummy went back in there the next day. <laughs> How many times have we been released from the snare? and turned around because there was something tasty in there, and he got caught the next day. So he, he got released, and then the following day, I catch another one in the barn. And, and so I thought, well, this was, this was Monday. So I had caught him Monday, and I thought, well, I've got this, some corn, corn on the cob left over from, from Easter dinner. So I bring him some corn, because I want him fed, and I bring him water, I make sure they're fine in there. You know, the, 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 you know, the accommodations are kind of tight, but the food's good. You know, and so I, I bring this in, and then I come back in a little while, and this squirrel has eaten all the corn off of a half of a cob, and he's laying on his back like, oh, <laughs> dead asleep. And I'm like, you little stink pot. And he's got this little fat tummy from eating everything. And, and, I, and so I, you know, released him. But what hit me in the midst of this was how we get into traps thinking that they're wonderful places. And, and the accommodations might be a little tight, but the food's great. And, and we might get released, and what do we do? We turn back around and go back inside, just like that. Um, yeah. And in a Proverbs uh, 117, uh, I think is, is beautiful. It, it talks about the fowler snare. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. If a bird can actually see the fowler, he won't go in there. Evidently squirrels aren't that smart. Because <laughs> he went right back in. Um, Satan um, will, you know, will, will tell us that that snare is okay. And it's okay. We'll be fine. You know, it, you know he's going to leave the lid off and we can get out anytime we want. It doesn't always happen that way. Uh, maybe recently a snare has trapped you. You know, as you read this uh, or hear this, maybe you're currently snared in something. It, it may be something small that you have fought with before. It may be that you've been released to it and, and went back in, like the squirrel. Um, uh, but, but God wants us to recognize who is setting those snares and be smart like the bird, and not dumb like the squirrel. Do as the bird did, going, I know what you're going to do, and I ain't going for it. Um, you know, we, so often we're like, I was free, I was, everything was marvelous, you know, and then all of a sudden this thing grabbed me and it pulled me down. Okay, you blew it. All right. You, you got in there and what are you going to do about it right now? Are you going to beat yourself up because, you know, you went back in? Or are you going to recognize that's pretty normal behavior? David knew and he reminds us that the Lord won't allow us to be the enemy's victim if we simply return to him and get smart and learn to recognize the enemy. That little squirrel did not see me as an enemy. He saw me as a provider of food. And I really wasn't an enemy. I didn't, I didn't kill him. I just took him down the road to another place that was beautiful to live. Repent and turn away from the sin. Allow the Holy Spirit and the Lord to free you from the trap. And you'll fly free again. Psalm 131 says, Lord, my heart is haughty. <clears throat> my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things too profound. So David here reminds himself that he is not to be prideful or haughty, and that it is something he needs to reject, and it needs to be seen as sin. And um, 
We shouldn't even trust literally in our own ability to hold on to God. We don't have that ability. It's God holding on to us that we have to trust. David said, I don't concern myself with great matters. And, and that's the thing that gets me, is that we have so much information coming at us in the media, more than ever in history. We know more about what's going on in the world and even things that we don't think affect us. And I don't think any of us were ever intended to take in that much negative. And then we end up concerning ourselves with great matters. Um, he was not making an excuse to avoid challenges in his life. He was recognizing that we need to pick our battles wisely because there will be one after another after another. This is a very well-known term in, in military strategy. When troops are thinly stretched, they fail. God is saying that we have to stay focused on the matters and the things that are important to us and the, and the road that he has chosen to put us on. We need to stay humble and choose our battles. There was, uh, um, uh, in 1920, there was a young Canadian, and, and this, this was a pride issue for this young man, Oswald Smith. You heard of him? He was convinced that God was calling him to the mission field. I'll save them, God. Over and over he prayed, Lord, I want to go as a missionary. This is what I want for you. Open the door of service, and it wasn't happening. Every time he did, the missionary boards were... were um, uh, were not selecting him and they were not allowing him to go and he'd go before the board and he would fail over and over. They said, no, you don't meet the qualifications. And he was crushed because he was so sure that this is what God had for him. But when he prayed, he sensed the Holy Spirit say, no, this is the true path here. You, you've got your mind, you've got your eyes on the wrong thing. What he did was he could not go as a missionary, but he started a church that sent out missionaries. In 1928, he founded the People's Church in Toronto, Canada. It grew and sent out more missionaries than other, any other church at that time. So he assessed the battle, but he was just going at it the wrong way. He chose his battle carefully, and he focused on the present, and he went to serve the Lord faithfully. So don't let the cares of this world and all of this stuff come down on you. And, and don't assume that you're the chosen one that God's going to fix, you know, fix this situation with. We need to stay humble. We need to stay right in the center of his will and let God do it. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful for all of these scriptures, all of these psalms, the, the openness of David that he shared his heart and he went from from being confident in you and thankful and in awe of you to, to upset with you because you weren't doing things the way he thought they should at the right moment to, to recognizing that his humility was important in the midst of all of this and allowing you, the creator of the universe, the one that holds the universe between the span of his hands, you can do this and you really don't need our help. And I thank you for that, Lord. And I pray that you would touch every woman in this room and drive home the truth that you have for her this day in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right.